my child. There is so much to tell you. That I have run out of time. The sacrifice I made was not enough. People still don't know how to play you. You must face these demons. Oh. You suck with Katarin. Admit it. Go on, please, admit it. Just this once. And today I'm going to tell you why. Does Tor protect you in your battles? Do you seek Ursun's respite from the frost? Well, don't worry, Tavarish. Supreme Patriarch Blakovich is going to look after you. And today we're going to be diving deep into why you suck with Katarin, the Ice Court, and Kislev as a faction. Your Ice Court campaigns will no longer be cut short. As a disclaimer, this is not a guide for multiplayer. It would take more than the power of a dying god to explain why you're so terrible at that. My name is Blake and I bid you my fondest welcome to Blake's Takes, where today I'll be giving you my take on why you're just awful with Katarin. Is my take hot or not? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed today's video, please consider liking and subscribing. It really helps the channel out. Mark my words, comrade, today things change. Today we take the fight back to the enemy. It will be their land, their people, their blood. Reason you suck with Katarin? Number one, you're not aggressive in your first turns. Your first few turns in a Katarin campaign are crucial for your success. You will need to be extremely aggressive in these turns to ensure your early Norskan enemy is defeated and you have a good staging post to begin the rest of your campaign to save the Northlands. Now, you have two major threats at the beginning of your campaign. Azag the Slaughterer in the southeastern mountains and Throp the Unclean from the Hell Pit in the north. Now, the mountainous regions where Azag dwells have a gold mine in them and they are suitable climate for your faction to settle in, so you want to focus on getting his territory first. Prague will act as a buffer state for you against Throt in the short term, and Clan Mulder will likely go to war with the Great Orthodoxy, so you have a bit of time before you need to fight them, while Azag will share a border with you once you capture your second province, and is therefore a more immediate threat. Now, the trouble is, your early game troops are terrible, and you can only recruit two of them at a time in the beginning. Kossars are advertised as a hybrid unit, meant to be capable in both ranged and melee combat, but I find that they are capable of neither and will be quickly slaughtered by Azag's superior melee forces. Armoured Kossars are slightly better, but they will also be rapidly outclassed in melee fights, especially against early game greenskin forces. However, these units can perform if you have enough of them, but unfortunately you've only got access to a tier 1 settlement with two recruitment slots, so to beat the Greenskins, you'll need to be delightfully devilish in your machinations. Ho 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 ho! Delightfully devilish, Katarin. Begin turn one by recruiting a boyar. Set him to muster some more Kossar serfs to assist you. They're poor troops, but are effective for what we need them to do, if we have enough of them. Wipe out the Norskans to the west and occupy Zavastra. Once this is done, have Katarin begin recruiting too. You need the extra boyar because you need troops quickly to take out Azag. Unfortunately, your default situation is just two recruitment slots, so the extra boyar allows you to pump out units faster for this Kossar Blitzkrieg we're planning. You will be drowning the enemy in a hailstorm of surf arrows. In Kislev, turn on the Relief Column's Province Commandment for more recruitment slots and recruitment discounts next turn. Focus on getting growth bonuses in this territory and Kislev, even so far as to demolish your barracks in the first turn and replace it with a tribal encampment on turn two. Build the Tallow Keepers Guild in the extra build slot on turn one. We'll get into why later in this video. 
Now on turn two, send your boyar to besiege Vetivo. Have Catherine force march to within reinforcement range and make the attack. Win the battle and occupy the settlement. In Kislev, build the tribal encampment building to boost growth. We'll get into why in a minute, but it's extremely important. Now, in Kislev, with your province commandment in force, you can now recruit four units at a time. But Blake, both of my lords are in different provinces, so I can't hire anything. I hear you cry. No matter, we simply hire yet another lord and recruit four Kossars in Kislev. Your lord in Vitevo should also hire another two Kossars. By turn three, we've got quite the Kossar tide forming. Have your lord in Vitevo launch an attack on Fort Jakova to besiege it, send Katerin to reinforce, and then force march your third lord to deliver the four Kossar units to either of the armies. Fight the battle and take the settlement, then disband the third lord. Now you have wiped out your first enemy and you have your second full province by turn three. You're also in the perfect position to move into the next stage of your campaign, which is reason you suck with Katerin number two. You don't ambush Azag. Now, as I alluded to in reason one, you have two main enemies in the early game. One being Azag the Slaughterer, the other being Throt the Unclean. Azag should be prioritized. You'll need to throw your Kossars at him early to prevent him from being able to build up significant force, or even worse, a war army. If Azag gets a war on the go, your campaign will become infinitely harder, so you must strike early. Azag should be your priority because he'll be the enemy at your gates. Azag is an immediate danger, which threatens to derail your entire campaign if not dealt with early, so you must not let him get strong. His territory is also suitable for you to settle, and Karak Ungor contains a gold mine, which you will need to fuel your glorious Bolshevik war machine. Also, if you have followed the steps in Reason 1, you will be in a perfect place to unleash your Kossar horde on him at an opportune time. You see, Azag starts up war with this ogre tribe featured here, the Rock Skulls. From my testing, every time by turn 4 or 5, he will have a full stack and a half stack of dangerous forces to bring to bear on you. But his forces will be preoccupied dealing with the Rock Skulls, living inside of Karak Raziak. Now the benefits to this are twofold. Firstly, and most importantly, Azag's forces will be divided. They will be either licking their wounds from doing battle recently and sacking the ogre settlement, or split apart raiding. Secondly, when you're ready to make your attack, you can ask the ogres to pay you for your orc extermination services. Nice. Now, this title is a little bit misleading, but I wanted the word to alliterate with Azag's name, but you don't actually have to ambush Azag in the total war sense of the word. You don't need to initiate an ambush battle, although that would be preferable, it's not a necessity. By ambush, I mean launch a surprise attack on him whilst his forces are disorganised dealing with the ogres. You'll have enough forces to overwhelm Azag and his garrison, so I strongly recommend doing that if you find him there. His second army is not a threat once Azag has been taken care of. Once you have taken care of these armies, take the rest of his province to wipe him out. By turn 10 in this campaign, Azag had decided to retire from existence, and that's because we had been relentlessly aggressive in our early turns and caught Azag when he didn't expect it. Remember, the longer you leave Azag to his own devices, the harder he is to get rid of. Attack quickly with your horde of Kossars and rip him from the ground, root and stem. With that done, you are now free to focus your attention to the northern threats, 
with the Hell Pit and Clan Mulder now being your highest priority. Reason you suck with Katarin, number three, you don't prioritize growth. It is vitally important to maximize growth so you can start working your way up to Kislev's better units. You can do this by building the Tallow Keepers Guild and Tribal Encampment in Kislev and the Roadhouse and Farm Buildings in settlements outside of the major Kislevite cities. Also, you can use Saliak's Motherland Blessing to further increase faction-wide growth and provide a bonus to replenishment rate, which I firmly advise you do from turn one. Now, why do we focus growth as Kislev, I hear you ask? As stated in Reason 1, your Kossars are pretty bad. They are designed to be a hybrid ranged and melee unit, but I find they do neither of these roles particularly well. They are only effective if you have a lot of them, and at 450 gold to recruit and 122 gold for upkeep costs, they aren't cheap for the lacklustre services they provide either. Armoured Kossars also leave a lot to be desired. Their pistols have very little armour-piercing damage value and they have limited ammunition and range. They are reasonable at holding enemies back but lack the ability to deliver any serious damage. Kossars and both variants of Armoured Kossar are pretty mediocre as they lack the damage dealing capabilities to get through any significant armoured threat. At Settlement 1 and 2, you have seriously limited options in terms of troops, and your heroes and spellcasters won't be carrying fights for you either, will be entirely reliant on sheer volume of fire from your Kossars to whittle down enemies. But this changes when your settlements hit level 3, and you get access to units which can carry you right through to the end game. I am, of course, talking about the mighty Streltsy, these units are excellent, they pack a serious armour piercing punch with their axe rifles and can whittle down the toughest of enemies from range. They are also competent in melee, but you should never intentionally send them into melee. They are ranged units first and foremost, but they are durable and can fight in hand to hand if necessary. Think of them like line infantry if you ever played Empire Total War. They should be forming the backbone of all of your armies moving forward. They're cheap for their stats and the utility they bring. They only take one turn to recruit, even if you recruit them globally, and they deliver a lot of armour-piercing firepower. They're best used against single targets, but can do a lot of damage to practically anything. Secondly, at level 3, you get access to the Toolmaker, this building is fantastic, not only does it give you a percentage modifier on your income, we'll go into that later, but it also lets you begin recruiting the fearsome war sleds. War sleds pack an armor piercing punch from range, they move quickly and deliver a devastating charge to infantry. They are extremely good and should also be a staple in all of your armies going forward. I like to put at least two of these in every army. Once you have your settlements to level 3, you should begin trying to outfit your armies with Streltsy and War Sleds as quickly as you're able to. You'll notice a massive difference in the damage you deal and the combat potential of your armies immediately. Reason you suck with Katarin, number 4. You don't bear bait the enemy. So, you've got a level 3 settlement. You've begun outfitting your armies with the more powerful units mentioned in Reason 3. But do you know how to use them effectively? Now, your war sleds play a crucial role on the battlefield. Use them to skirmish with the enemy forces. What I find is that they are sufficiently annoying that they will often draw the attention of the enemy's fast-moving units. Those units will give chase to your nimble war sleds, which can lure the enemy back to your streltsy gun lines where they can be mown down with their murderous musketry. This is what I call bear baiting, where your war sleds have baited the enemy's fast moving units into an ideal position for you to delete them. Your war sleds can also be used to charge enemy infantry formations for catastrophic damage. You can do this whilst you skirmish or as the enemy draws into your streltsy firing lines. But be careful about sending war sleds after enemy artillery pieces. 
I found during my testing that they would often get stuck on the equipment, leading them to a grisly demise. Now, how do you set up your Streltsy firing line for maximum effect? Firstly, you want to ensure your terrain has no significant hills or troughs which can obstruct your Streltsy's line of sight. You want your Streltsy to ideally be on flat ground or up a hill where they can fire down on enemies. Avoid wooded areas which can block your bullets, but feel free to place them just inside woods as their bullets should not be blocked, and as a bonus, returning missile fire will be blocked instead. You want your war sleds to draw the enemy to areas where you have clear line of sight on the enemy. Now to assist with this, I really like using the checkerboard formation for my Streltsy gun lines. This formation is simple to set up and effective in a lot of scenarios. As I said earlier, Streltsy are competent melee combatants and can take a punch when they're tied up fighting hand to hand. The checkerboard allows your back ranks to continue firing on the enemies while your forward ranks hold them back. The Chaos and Norsken factions you should be going up against in the Northern Wastes have a very strong emphasis on melee combat and they will eventually make it to your firing lines. The checkerboard formation allows your back line of Streltsy to continue firing on the enemy. Now how do you make and control a checkerboard formation in battle, I hear you ask. To create one, firstly select your Streltsy and put them in a line, then select every second unit holding the control key. Once selected, let go of the control key and hold the alt key and hold left click to drag them forward. Now in the battle, if you want to rotate them to get a better angle on an approaching enemy, select all of your Streltsy, hold down control, alt and the left click button to rotate them. This can be used if the AI choose to attack from an unpredicted angle. Now, mastery of this will be critical to your success as Kislev. Bait their units into your firing lines for maximum effect. I find you can supplement this strategy with a few Ice Guard units. They can be placed behind your Streltsy firing line to launch volleys of slowing arrows into the enemy to keep them pinned down in your Streltsy firing lines for longer. Ice Guard have good damage, but it isn't armor piercing so they struggle against anything with armour on, but their arrows have a slowing effect that affects everything, regardless of armour. They should be considered a supporting unit to your Streltsy, never a unit that carries battles due to their armour-piercing limitation. Chaos and Norska have a lot of heavily armoured units in their arsenal, so bear this in mind. Another way to support the Streltsy firing line is with Frost Magic, you can use your Frost Maidens to drop an Ice Sheet down. This slows units in a large area of effect, and is very useful to use when units move into range of your Streltsy. They can also use other spells like the Ice Maiden's Kiss to slow other enemies who were not caught in the Ice Sheet. If you decided to be an absolute mad lad like me and go with the Lore of Tempest, you can actually still slow enemies with them as well, just not in the debuff sense of the word. You see, the AI is programmed to dodge bombardment spells at all costs, so you can just drop a hailstorm right next to the feet of your Streltsy and the AI will turn to awkwardly try and avoid it. <gasps> Idiot! This can slow them down just long enough for your forces to pop off another volley at them. The Kislevite laws of magic, frost and tempest may be pretty terrible, but they're a resource you should still use you should still try and make use of the winds of magic that you generate. The Ice Witches get some pretty nice bonuses whilst training in the Ice Court too, so don't forget to train them and utilise them on the battlefield. And by that I mean don't forget about them on the battlefield as well, like I did. Right here. So remember, when you hit Settlement Level 3, you gain a massive power spike. You get access to Streltsy and War Sleds. Set up your Streltsy in a checkerboard formation and use your War Sleds to lure enemy fast movers into your firing lines by skirmishing with them. The enemy forces will find this harassment unbearable 
and will often charge out to meet your shooty sleds. Bring them back to your Streltsy for a warm welcome. Utilize Ice Guard and your Frost Magic to keep them in your firing lines for longer. Reason you suck with Katarin, number five. You honor the dragon. The dragon lords of Cathay sit far away in their ivory towers whilst your men forge the real bulwark against chaos for this world. Where they cower behind walls, we struggle on with knowing grit and determination that the bodies of our sons and daughters are what protects these lands. They know not the pain and suffering of the Kislevite people. They mock us with their wealth. This means you should feel no shame in relieving them of that very same wealth. Trade caravans will often be passing through your territories. You should plunder them and extract their many bounties. The Cathayans will do nothing about this, and as you slowly build up your strength, they will often come to you for terms. This is yet another opportunity to extract some more coin from them. They are too far away to be of consequence, they will not send forces after you for pillaging their trade routes. So pillage away, and invest that money into more troops to defend your lands. Their merchants delved too greedily and too deep. They know what they awoke in the frozen north. Gunpowder and claws. Reason you suck with Katarin, number six. You don't know about convoys. In June of 1940, Allied shipping was on its knees. U-boats from the German Kriegsmarine were stealthily destroying millions of tons of cargo in an attempt to starve the United Kingdom into submission. And at first, it was spectacularly successful. But by 1943, the U-boat's effectiveness was next to nothing. This is because the Allies started travelling their merchant vessels in armed convoys. This lesson from history can be applied to your campaign with Throt the Unclean. After you've finished off Azag, Throt will inevitably declare war on you, and their stalk stance will be extremely effective at catching you where you least expect it. You won't be able to see where Throt has positioned his troops on the campaign map until it's too late. The vermin tide will be upon you. You must be patient when dealing with Throt. If he catches one of your armies moving by itself, you will likely outnumber it massively with multiple armies. This will either cause you enormous casualties or a total army wipe. Remember, overwhelming numbers is a direct counter to your ranged units, which form the backbone of your army. If you are vastly outnumbered, you will have no way to kill all the rats before they can inflict severe casualties. Your magic isn't good enough to kill blobs of infantry particularly effectively. Move your forces together in convoy to protect themselves from these Skaven wolf packs. Furthermore, the in-camp stance gives you an extra 75% protection from enemy ambushes, which is extremely helpful battling against Skaven's stalking ability. You need to keep your forces together. Move slowly and methodically to take the Hell Pit. This will destroy the Skaven's ability to recruit their high-tier units. Then continue in convoy until you find Throt himself. Once you have taken the Hell Pit and defeated Throt, you will have defanged the Skaven threat. They will only be able to throw low-tier clan rats and Skaven slaves at you, so you should be able to wipe them out with little further trouble. Remember, Throt the Unclean is a very powerful foe. Keep your forces together and preferably encamped to ensure you're not swarmed or, even worse, ambushed by his rat hordes. Under no circumstances should you use the Force March ability in Skaven-controlled territory. This will all but guarantee them ambushing you. If you're caught out, he can bring a terrifying amount of rats to bear down upon you. Your ranged units have a hard time dealing with such vast quantities of entities, even up the playing field by keeping another force nearby. Take the Hell Pit to remove his recruitment capabilities and kill Throt's army, and you will have neutered the threat. If they stand for Clan Mulder, they die for Clan Mulder. March methodically, building by building, 
room by room, one rat at a time. Reason you suck with Catherine, number seven. You don't occupy all the land that you can. Kislev is a very wealthy faction. They can make a lot of gold from their territories, their income buildings are very good, and they can get the Toolmaker building to add a percentage modifier to it. Toolmakers also give you extra global recruitment capacity. Pair this with the Citadel of Prague, which reduces global recruitment time by two, and you can basically globally recruit an entire army in the later game wherever you want. It's beautiful. But wait, there's more. Now even lands which are uninhabitable are actually very valuable to you. Not because the land itself will bring you in a lot of coin, but because of Atomans. For every two full provinces you own, you'll be granted an Ataman. These chaps act as governors for your provinces. They can buff a whole host of things province-wide and are extremely useful. Income, recruit ranks of heroes and units, happiness, growth, they'll even come out and defend your territory if the provincial capital is under siege. They're excellent and have zero downside. Ensure you get an Ataman into all of your major provinces which generate you a lot of income. Now also, Kislev gets massive benefits from natural resource buildings. These can be faction-wide bonuses to economy buildings like farms and marketplaces, reduction of building costs for provincial capitals, or my personal favourite, iron, which gives faction-wide upkeep reduction across the board. Iron helps us play! If a settlement has access to a natural resource, build the relevant resource extraction building. The benefits you get for doing so are outrageously good. Remember, full provinces are extremely valuable to you. One settlement provinces like Wood Elf Forests count as a full province, so if you end up fighting Athel Lauren, you can get a whole heap of provinces and Atomans as a consequence of that. You should always be land hungry to unlock Atomans, which govern your provinces as well as grabbing up natural resources for faction-wide benefits. You should be expanding the motherland's borders and consolidating full provinces as much as possible. Reason you suck with Katarin, number eight, you're clumsy in diplomacy. As a major player in the world's economy, Kislev can make a disgusting amount of money from trade with other factions. This passive income is extremely valuable and the AI will often pay you for the privilege of it. Every turn, jump into your diplomacy screen and check the quick deal tab to see if any discovered factions would like to trade with you. You can sell trade agreements in the later game for a tidy sum of money. This can be a lovely little cash boost. But be careful who you trade with in the early game. For example, Dreyker's Wood Elf faction starts at war with Ostermark directly south of you. Do not engage in diplomacy with Ostermark. Even a non-aggression pact can provoke the wrath of Dreyker, and the last thing you need whilst you are busy dealing with a Skaven infestation in the north is an invasion of angry tree people attacking you from the rear. It's turn 60, how do you have so many tree men? God, there's so many tree men. My little southern excursion to deal with Dreyka cost me valuable time. It turns out she is a very hard enemy to uproot. In fact, I'd recommend not fighting any of the Order factions in the south if you can help it. Firstly, you're going to be dealing with a lot of threats from the north and the east. Archaon, Kolek and their Norsken vassals the Chaos Dwarves, the Orcs, and the Ogres. You're going to be very busy in the North and Eastern regions, so you should really think carefully before opening up another front to dilute your forces. Secondly, your forces are basically designed to fight Chaos. Good ranged attacks paired with capable melee stats mean that after those hordes of Chaos have charged at you and endured your withering volleys, you'll be able to cut them down in the melee grind. Your ranged units are considerably worse at dealing with other ranged units, as you will tend to have shorter range than other order factions ranged units. This can make your strategy of mass streltsy far more challenging to pull off. You'll have to think about adding more cavalry and sargard into your armies. 
these units being more expensive and requiring higher tier buildings to produce. It's best to play to your strengths. Go and fight Chaos, be friends and trade with the Order Factions. You can even go and recruit some of their better artillery if you get an alliance and an outpost built. I'm not going to lie, there were times where I considered invading Wolfenberg for that sweet, sweet gold mine, but I resisted the temptation. It's never wise to open up a war on two fronts if it can be avoided, and you must be conscious of diplomatic penalties if you do start a war of aggression on your order-aligned neighbours. Your ranged powers are worse than theirs, you'll have plenty to deal with in the north and east. My advice is to just trade with them instead. In conclusion, I'd say I enjoyed the Ice Core campaign. There was a giddy thrill in hurling swarms of Kossars into enemies at the beginning, and Throtz was a terrifying threat in the early game. I will say, however, I do think that some of their units need a buff. I found myself feeling pigeonholed into one playstyle, mass streltsy with war sleds and bear riders. Their other units just didn't perform nearly as well as that combination of units. I'd have liked to have used the Griffin Legion more because they look incredible aesthetically, but I found that they were quite fragile, even though they're a tier 5 unit. Also, the whole supporters element of the Kislev game needs a rework. Kostaltin had been wiped out by turn 30, so that entire game mechanic basically fell over. So, do you agree with my take on why you suck with Katarine? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed today's video, please consider liking and subscribing. It really helps the channel out. I've been Blake, delivering my take. Thank you all so much for watching.